presented by TAFE Directors Australia uh, on behalf of TAFEs uh, around Australia for this particular session called Engaging Trades Learners in a Virtual Classroom. To commence our session today, I want to particularly uh, pay our welcome to and uh, make our welcome to country. So we acknowledge the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and recognise continuing connection to land, uh, waters and culture. We, are, we pay our respect to their elders past, present and emerging. Today, we are broadcasting from Ngunnawal country. Well, we're really excited to bring you together for this uh, TDA event, focusing on how we can bring virtual reality to uh, trades training, which of course, many of you online are in the middle of this at the moment, either last year when uh, COVID forced you to uh, create new approaches to how you did your trades training, and of course, how you are now taking that forward. Uh, we like to think that trade teachers are the heart and soul uh, of the TAFE world, really being the backbone to the evolution of TAFEs across Australia. And also, of course, we recognise that the trades are often at the forefront of technological advancement. And so we're really pleased that you're able to uh, join with us uh, today. And we really are pleased that you can come together as part of the Australia-wide TAFE community we can be a lot stronger together to be able to demonstrate the power of TAFE and the position of TAFE as key agents for uh, reform and for opportunity for individuals right across uh, this wide, great land. So what are we going to be doing today? We're going to be hearing from two of our key speakers. Uh, we have a speaker from uh, TAFE SA, who I'll introduce in a minute. Uh, and also we have um, a speaker who is experienced in trades, training uh, and using technology. And he now runs a company called InfiniSpark. And I'll introduce uh, 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 Hus Rapani uh, later on. But now let's go to our, our first speaker. And I'm really pleased to introduce um, Shannon Baldock. Uh, Shannon's a refrigeration lecturer in TAFE SA. Many of you may know him by name and hopefully now you can know him by face. Um, Shannon took the TDA conference or uh, convention in Brisbane in 2019 by storm uh, by bringing along some of his virtual reality technology. And that's what we're going to hear now. What's been some of that journey um, that Shannon's been on uh, in TAFE SA. Uh, so over to you, Shannon, and welcome. Um, thank you very much for that, Craig. You're going to make me blush. Um, what I wanted to share with you today is um, part of a project we undertook here at, at TAFE SA. It was a pilot, um, which is being slowly taken up through parts of the organisation. So um, I'm going to show off my technological skills by quickly sharing something. And, um, and don't let Hustman... Uh, tell you that he showed us how to do this. This was totally <laughs> my plan. So, um, first, I'm going to start off uh, when this fires up. I just, I always like to take this through. I think history is very important to, to give us an idea of how we got to where we are, um, especially with, with emerging technologies. A lot of these things didn't just come out of nowhere. Um, so, it's important to know where, where we started. And look, to some people in the audience, this may be telling you how to suck eggs a little bit, but to give you an understanding of the base ideas around some of this VR uh, uh, training that we're trying to achieve. So I just want to start off by saying, you'll hear a lot of these terms bandied around. Um, we're going to hear XR, VR, and AR. And really what I want you to understand is XR is the umbrella term when we're talking about basically extended reality. So this is us making up our own worlds and our own objects to engage learners. Um, VR, as you can see, um, that dapper looking fellow there in the red shirt, um, that's a VR headset. We're completely taking over that field of view. Everything we give to that learner, they're basically sucking in. Um, they talk about 100% engagement. We don't ever really get that, but in that situation, it's very hard for the students to stick their phone in between the headset to get distracted by their phones. Um, huge increase in engagement, which we can make use of. The other one there, we talk about an augmented reality. So that's where we're overlaying virtual objects on the real world. Um, both of these have their own uh, niches and both of them have ways that we can use them. And the most important thing is 
this doesn't have to be a very expensive or a complicated thing. What I will say from the outset is the whole point of our project was to be able to develop this content with no um, more expertise than a lecturer would have who can find their way around your, your LMS um, and some sort of fairly basic IT skills. And that's the point, because we know that if this is out of reach for our lecturers, they just won't pick it up. Um, the other bit I'll just take you through, and I think this is important to understand, first of all, how we learn and how this helps us learn. Um, we talk about three docs and six docs. Um, three degrees of freedom is basically, some of you may have uh, seen a headset like this. One of the kids might have come home from school with a little cardboard box you stick your phone in. Um, you can look left and right and up and down. So seated experience, really just feeding in information to people, what we'd probably call immersive. Uh, and we use that for immersive video. The other side we've got is six degrees of freedom. Now, this is the really cool stuff. This is where people have got controllers in their hands. They're physically picking up stuff and then moving it around. That's where we start getting to, into the interactive. Now, a lot of what we talk about is three dot um, because we find it's really achievable. It's easy to do. And, and a lot of um, companies sorry, in the private sector that picked up VR for training are sort of exclusively in that three DOS space. So where do we get here? Um, so back in the 90s, people were playing around with VR. They've sort of been toying around with this for a long time, but no one's really found a great application to run with it. Um, and you'll see here the cardboard headset. So that was the Google Cardboard, came out in sort of the early 2000s um, and basically used people's mobile phone to create this sort of VR experience. Good, cheap, and it got heaps of people to have a play and a muck around with it. A lot of what we have today is based around that, that sort of simple notion. You'll also see there the Oculus. Now that's higher end, a purchased headset. You've got a couple of grand's worth of headset there with probably a $3,000 computer sitting under the desk. So that's high end stuff. Now, this is where we've got to. Now, this is where we're going. What, what you're looking at right there is the new HoloLens 2. Um, this is an augmented reality headset. Um, the, Ameri the American military has just purchased thousands and thousands of these for training um, their soldiers. Um, and something else which I think is a really, really great little use case we've heard about the, uh, the HoloLens. Um, BHP was having issues during COVID where they couldn't train some of their remote um, mechanics. Um, so what they needed to do is they needed to take them through a quite complicated procedure without the train being able to be on site with the mechanics. So what they actually did is they sent a couple of these headsets up to the Pilbara and then using sort of like a Zoom call, but via a, a, an augmented reality headset, they actually took those um, mechanics through how to undertake that task on the piece of equipment. Now, the thing I like about this story is the guy that undertook it was really worried they wouldn't be able to work it out when they sent the piece of equipment. So we actually sent one to his mum. So we sent one to his mum to try how easy it was to actually get the headset out of the box, turn it on, and then go through that task. Um, you are going to see more and more of this come through, um, not only with training, but remote support for trade areas. It's already started to get to the point now, some factory workers will have one of these on site and they'll use it to, to engage with the engineers when they're doing repairs. So I always like to start with this, can we, can we use this XR stuff to improve training? Because I think this is a question that doesn't always get asked. We like the technology and I'm a fairly practical guy, try and stay out of the shiny stuff. Our focus was, what will this actually do to improve our training and what sort of areas? And the first thing I needed to look at is, well, how, how does this help our learning? And if we take the most simplest point of view is, we learn by having experiences, okay? By, and that experience might be doing stuff. Now that's the hands-on stuff, um, which a lot of us do, but it might also just be being in an environment, being talked through that one-on-one -on -one with the lecturer, and we sat down, well, which one of those things can we capture in VR? And the important thing we found is that if you're going to make an environment for people, now our human brain, we're pretty well designed to understand what's real and what's not. And if anyone that's ever seen a, a, a doll from like the 1920s that sort of looks a little bit human that isn't quite, that freaks you out, 
you understand how the human brain rebels against stuff that's not real. It's like that bloke that's got the toupee. You can't really hear what he's saying because you're concentrating on his wit. We, we know what's real and we know what's not. So the simplest way we found to make things real is just to capture them, just to video them. So we, we try not to build environments. We try to go out and capture them. So what you're seeing right there is part of one of our 360 immersive videos we took with a, with a VR camera. Now, that was one of our lecturers decanting ammonia. Now, ammonia is pretty nasty stuff, and we can't take students to this site. And it's something that we've, we've found it difficult to really engage the learners with this because they, they've got no sense of what it is. So we go to site, we take a lecturer, we do a VR video of that, and then we bring it back to class, put the students in the headset, and each one of those, it's a one-on-one -on -one experience with that lecturer going through that task. Now, that's something that, that historically, this was load everyone in the bus, take them down to the site, and then run them through the task. And even when you do that, you'll get two guys up the front that are watching, the one guy up the back that's thinking about the weekend. So you're still not getting that total immersion, each student with a headset on running through that video, um, we're getting huge increases in, uh, in retention of that information. And especially around this hat safety stuff. Now you can't have stuff that works without the stuff that doesn't work. Now, as we get down the track, I think we're gonna find more and more ways to use this technology to uh, engage with our learners. But right at this point in time, when we're going through a unit of competency and there's doing stuff, so there's undertake or um, be involved in or create, the technology's not there at the moment. So where we try and use the technology is if there is something or somewhere we cannot take the students due to expense, um, due to uh, hazards, or even just, just practicality, um, this is a valuable option. So um, we are now getting to the point where industry is coming to us and saying, hey, would you like to see the inside of the substation? We know we can't bring your students here. Why don't you come out with the camera, capture that on site with one of your lecturers and bring it back. So effectively, it's just, it is really just a video. It is a 360 spherical video. So you can look out and around in that three degrees of freedom, totally having captured all of your attention. So the VLE project started out, um, there is some rapid changes happening in refrigeration at the moment. Um, there's a transition away from the old um, ozone depleting refrigerants, the CFCs that used to be in our spray can. Um, and we are moving to these new products which have a very, very low effect on the climate. Um, these are CO2, hydrocarbon and ammonia. Now each of those have quite um, significant hazards with them. And it's a very, very new technology. So it's really hard to take all of our students along. It's even very hard to build some equipment here on site because by the time we have built the equipment at significant extent, the technology has moved on. So we've worked out that if we can build this engagement with industry and industry starts coming to us to say, hey, Tate, we've just actually put in a new plant. Would you like to come and capture it for your students? So we can see a couple of videos here. So these uh, videos were taken in the basement of a brand new IGA here in South Australia. Um, we are not allowed to take students in to this site, but we took the lecturers down there and did all of those training videos. So rather than being in front of class, we did all of those training videos on site. Um, and the thing we found that's far more powerful about that is like, being in the room with the equipment. This is the stuff we love. Um, it also means that if we bring in subject matter experts, they are far more comfortable being in their own environments than they are coming and standing in front of our class. We can get far better content. And when we start to talk to our lecturers and people from industry, they always say, if I could get this one-on-one -on -one engagement with each of the students, imagine how much, how much better that would be. We talk to some of our senior lecturers and they always say, if you could grab some of these young guys by the scruff of the neck, and take them through that task one-on-one, -on -one, that's awesome um, immersion, it's awesome training. Now, the thing we found that works really well with the safety training is currently a lot of our safety training, if we think about white card, 
uh, and a lot of these things is photos and still images of sites and still images of hazards. They're not dynamic, and sometimes they're not even related to what that student might be doing in their workplace. What we have done is we will go out and we will capture multiple sites and we'll capture live video. So there's a forklift driving past. There is people moving around the site. There's a crane lift. And the student has to be aware in a real situation of everything going on around them, not just this 2D box on the screen. And we've found that's really, really good. We, I remember we were uh, doing one of our videos and uh, while we were doing it, a truck drove past. And traditionally we would have gone, oh, that's terrible. We've, that's distracted the students. But that's actually a really good piece of content now because those students have to be aware of everything that's going around them. The real world isn't looking through a square box like we would see on a 2D video. The real world is everything going on around them. Um, and the point I always come back to is this doesn't have to be a very, very expensive thing. The cameras for this are the prices are coming down. The skills that are needed to capture this content if you can um, operate a video camera, you can operate one of these cameras. And we don't have to have, so we have um, a set of uh, headsets here. We have about 46 headsets here at Tondley um, of actual VR headsets. But as you can see on the screen there, we also have some of the um, traditional types of uh, like a Google Cardboard headset. They're about uh, five to $10 each. You can give those as a welcome pack to your students with these videos. Um, we have one which uh, is actually a flyover of Tonsley. So without my manager's approval, and I'm assuming my manager's not listening, um, no one will be listening to this. We flew a drone over Tonsley, which is our site here with one of the cameras attached to it. So the students, when they come to site, they just see a flyover of the entire site. And then one of our lectures actually takes them on a walk through site. Now, that's not the only way we do it. We still do a traditional um, take five at the start of the day and show everyone where the toilets are and, and that sort of induction. But this sits in our learning platform there. It's a little bit more engaging. It's a bit of fun. And it also gives us time to show them parts of the site they may not normally see. And, and look, so to give you an idea for people who'd like to go out and look out into this space, there's numerous ways where you can start in this area. It doesn't have to be going and buying $20,000 a very expensive camera. Um, there are free apps. So Google Street View is a free program which you can use to capture 360 degree photographs. You can do that with a standard camera. Um, Google Photos again is free. You can use that for sharing um, 360 photos and videos. YouTube has a lot of 360 degree content on it. And the last three we talk about there, the first is, a, is called frame.io. That's actually some immersive VR based around a web browser. I'll, I'll put that one up there to let you go off and find. Sketchfab is actually an online platform for sharing 3D objects. So there's uh, compressors, houses, cars, all of these objects which people can view on their phones. In, in 360. And the last one there is, is Matterport, which is actually a 360 scanning environment. Now, if you go to uh, the defense page on, that's my alarm going off. Sorry, everyone, that's being too organized. Um, if you look onto our defense page of TAFE SA, you'll actually see that there is a 360 scan done of the Oberon submarine in Sydney Harbor. And that's actually used with some of our defense students and it's used partially for marketing but it's also used um, to give our students a sense of what it's actually like to be in some of these environments that they're working. So look, I thank you very much for the time. That was a bit of a, a, a brief overview of it. Um, if anyone would like any further information, by all means, reach out to me via LinkedIn, um, send us a message and uh, we're always happy to help out. And look, um, I think the, the thing I'd really like to thank uh, Craig and the team of bringing TAFE together. There's huge resources out there amongst all of our different campuses. It's great to see it when we bring it together. Thanks, Craig. Good on you. Thanks, Shannon. And I sh it was remiss of me that I didn't mention earlier on that there is a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. So if you have got any particular questions, uh, we will be uh, ready to answer those. 
Uh, and we've got somebody here who will go through those. And we might, in fact, ask Shannon a couple of questions uh, if they're coming through. But as a starting point, um, Shannon, I wonder if you might be able to talk through what's been your observation about the sense of engagement or, or the change of engagement of the students? I'm assuming you've taught, um, you've been a lecturer uh, pre-VR and post-VR. Interested in your reflections on that? Look, I think um, one of the, the best things we've really found, um, one of the most rapid uptakes in VR is actually video games. So we're actually getting a lot of students that are coming through that they're actually, um, I mean, when I first started teaching, I would have heard of a VR headset. Now we're getting a lot of students that that's what they have personally at home. The prices have dropped with commercial VR headsets. Um, and they are seeing that it, it's great for gaming, but it's great for gaming because of the immersion, it really sucks people in. You do have their entire field of view. You can use sound. Um, but just the retention, like you, got, you ask some of these guys questions after they've been through one of the videos, they've listened to all of it. I don't get that retention when I show a video in class or I have it sitting on front of them in a screen. I mean, I showed one of these videos to my 10 year old and I had a really quite comprehensive explanation of the value of CO2. Um, that, 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 that's why they call it immersive. You've got their sight, you've got their sound, um, everything that you feed into them, whether it's you speaking or that it's just being in an environment, they do suck it in. Um, and that's what we really ask for. I mean, you talk about the levels of engagement when we do just have a standard video, it, it's patchy. The, the engagement from this, this is why the likes of Walmart and people like this have picked this up and they're using it for their inductions now because they know they've got the content. If they weren't watching the video and off making a cup of coffee, they saw the video. Uh, yeah, no, we found that really powerful, Craig. Oh, that's good. I was out at um, the Smart Farm for Sunny Tafe in Mildura a couple of weeks back, and they were telling me about their vetting school students who come through, particularly for a course on farm safety. And so they use um, the VR goggles. And in fact, one of the one of the examples is they're sort of on the motorbike or whatever, going along quite safely or sedately um, on a farm. And all of a sudden, a, a vehicle comes and runs into them uh, from the from the side. And they said that, in fact, it's that that um, reality, like it was virtual, of course, um, really alerted them to the where uh, risks can come from on a, on, on a farm setting. So, yeah, certainly they would confirm that uh, message as well. We've got Ron Jackson here, uh, part of the TDA team, and he's been looking at some of the questions that have been coming through. Ron, have you got some questions? Certainly have. Thanks, Craig. And Shannon, um, there's obviously been a lot of interest in um, what you've had to um, pa uh, pass over to, to the team here. And um, there's been a lot of thank yous for that. I guess the starting point, um, in a sense, is how do you upskill teachers in this new tech? And in doing that, was that a lengthy process? So, you, so recently we had um, four lecturers from TAFE Queensland that came down to visit us and then we had a bit of a run through with, with some of their guys. Now we spent um, a full day with them. Um, we took them right through, not from just the development of the content, but lots of conversations around, well, where are we going to use it? Um, so I think, and the thing I'm really a strong believer in is peer-to-peer -peer training amongst lecturers. I know that a lot of our guys, when people come down and sort of give us a bit of an edict to undertake a new task, it's not always the best way to engage our guys. Unfortunately, a lot of lecturers are stubborn. That may shock some people, but they're a bit stubborn. But when they see it happening, especially tradesmen, they see it like, wow, that worked really well. You really sucked that class in. Cool, come and have a try, strap on the headset. Would you like to come with me next time I'm doing it? So, I mean, look, we, we gave a full day of training and at the end of that, I'm pretty, sh I'm pretty confident they could have taken that uh, and with the right equipment, run with it and, and made their own content. So that last session of the day, we were creating content. Now, obviously the complexity of that content increases the, the complexity, but for what we are doing, which is effectively 360 degree video, if you can take a video, you, you, you're halfway there. That's great. And that, another interest, obviously, is that, you know, with trades being so hands-on, can you use the VR for completing hands-on tasks? Or do you see this more, or do you use it more as a visual aid and then have to do some um, physical hands-on? So, 
we're not we're currently not undertaking assessments within the app and that's why i went back to that saying look if we, we've got some of those which aren't observed so white card sort of stuff observe identify understand we use this to give the content we will take them out of vr and then we'll give them a, a traditional assessment um but we find that the retention rates we get with that are, are significantly better um it's just a far better way to get content in the other issue we do have is that um work in a government organization to actually go out and build software and bring it into the environment where you want to have this interactive stuff is costly that's where it starts to get costly now i know um, TAFE New South Wales have been very successful with this for their digital team. So they're actually creating um, content, immersive and starting to lead to uh, assessment. Fantastic stuff. Um, but I've, I've taken, so we're sort of aiming at the same goal. They are moving down the side of the interactive and we've done, we're down the immersive side of things. But that also means that we can use that across floristry, across vet nursing, people can pick this up and run with it without just, uh, um, just a real focus on one task. Oh, that's great. We also have some, um, obviously quite a lot of interest in what you've presented and, um, and a few other questions, but we might um, just let people know that um, in the questions that we haven't answered, what we'll do at the end of the webinars, um, collate those and, and provide a response back. Um, yep, there's a lot of interest. Yeah, and there's a lot of interest in how, um, if someone's starting from ground zero, if you like, in terms of within their tape, how can they get help and, and, and advice and getting it up and running um, in, in terms of what you've done at TAFE SA. So it's uh, very Thanks. encouraging. Yes. Thanks, Ron. And I can see here on the chat, um, Andrew Weeks is asking, what was the name of the 3D mapping software again? And will um, the presentation be available to view later? So Shannon, you may want to give the name of that 3D mapping tool again. Yeah, so the one we've, we've used and, and, and putting on my government hat, there are a number of different things you could potentially use. Um, Matterport is what we have been experience, uh, experimenting with. It's, it's quite common in the real estate industry. Um, but, but most modern CAD packages have that functionality in them. But um, yeah, like I said, that my, this will, presentation will be up um, afterwards, Craig. And, and uh, like I said, I'll answer any questions. Um, if people want to fire them through, um, I'll take them on notice. Fantastic. So for those of you who have got questions and maybe they haven't been answered, as Shannon has said, we, we are recording those questions and we'll work through them and be back in contact uh, with you. What we do know that in 2020, we were faced with a whole range of challenges as uh, organisations, as teachers, as states went into various um, periods of lockdown and students had to be engaged from within their home setting. And there was a whole range of approaches that were taken. We took the opportunity uh, towards the end of last year to ask for some reflections from uh, the TAFEs um, and what was their story of adaptation during these most unusual uh, of times. I must say the key message that I received is that people were saying, I've been amazed at how people have engaged in the, with the challenge adapted technology in ways that possibly even surprised um, the teachers themselves um, to keep those students engaged. And we produced a report on that uh, last year, sort of the TAFE's response to COVID. And Ron's going to give us a quick overview of that report now. Thanks, Ron. Uh, thank you, Craig. I'll just, um, uh, just run through a couple of slides here, um, which gives the background to um, the TAFE's response to COVID and also um, what happened when the alternatives need to occur um, in terms of um, safety measures around responding to COVID um, in a fiscal sense and what this may mean going forward and, and, and the reflections that this imposes for today. Um, so, um, here we go. <laughs> the technology, don't you love it? Um, so in terms of, um, uh, this is a reflection on TAFE's response to COVID and as Craig mentioned that there's a um, report produced by TDA, the power of TAFE COVID story and that focuses on the responses um, across Australia by TAFE to the, um, the nation's, nation's management of a COVID um, um, experience. And, and today in some ways this um, was a prompt for both what um, Shannon has presented but also when we come to Huss, what Huss will present 
because in some ways um, it's about um, taking those reflections and how do we use those reflections going forward. Um, TAFE's um, in, res in responding to um, uh, COVID basically had four broad categories they placed um, uh, courses into. Um, the first one was what um, they called type one or digital ready. These were courses that were largely already online and therefore um, there was not a lot of work needed to be undertaken to continue with those online and teachers were able to basically switch to uh, campus students to digital del delivery without any major issue. The second one was courses that were digitally suited. Um, with some amendment, they were able to move students onto uh, digital delivery, perhaps with some additional resourcing for um, students and support from teachers. So those two um, types of um, courses were pretty well um, suited to digital to delivery um, already. Um, then there's a couple of courses, which uh, or types of courses. One is the digital, what were digital digitally challenging, um, which is challenging to say for me. <laughs> Um, and these were um, courses that had some skills um, acquisition elements to them, which may need equipment or close oversight from teachers and had a reasonable amount of practical requirements to them. Um, here, teachers either felt um, insufficiently prepared for delivery uh, in a digital form or didn't feel like they were um, had the skills um, necessary for digitally um, delivering those courses. So generally what happened there was the theoretical um, parts of the learning were moved online, but the more practical parts were, were generally deferred um, because of the um, requirements for safety measures around COVID on campus. And then the final one is, is probably what uh, we're, we're here talking about today in a sense is how, did we, how do we learn from what we saw as digitally limited courses in the sense that they were too difficult um, for a range of reasons to be delivered in a digital context. And typically they were mostly the trades courses or where teachers felt they did not have the digital delivery skills or the background to do that. Um, and most of those courses um, ended up not being brought online. Um, what was the alternative to going digital? Well, the alternative to going digital is that um, actions had to happen to make social distancing work. And that was um, things like um, split classes, staggered breaks, spacing out um, equipment and furniture, putting in um, rescheduling of block releases. Um, and also um, um, in some instances, there were students who just did not want to return to campus for that, um, for a whole range of reasons around the risk of, around COVID. And I guess this was especially the true, true for practical and trades. The issue with this obviously is it's not sustainable going forward for most um, training organisations, including TAFEs, it's expensive, it's inefficient. And, and to be honest, a lot of the feedback from students was that that on-campus experience was devalued to, to a degree and it lowered the students' um, um, on-campus experience. So what we're doing today is just reflecting um, both from Shannon and then um, coming with Haas um, about taking some of those lessons forward in terms of um, developing new ways to teach um, um, trades in a digital sense. And this is, a, a, um, and I think Hustle emphasised this quite a bit, it's not just about reflecting face-to-face uh, -face, um, learning and teaching, but developing new ways to learn and teach that makes full use of that blended and online learning models as an alternative to having that face-to-face -face engagement. And as I think um, you might know, with Shannon, the actual experience can be actually enriched more perhaps than um, just um, pure face-to-face -face learning. Um, thank you. Good on you, thanks Ron. So there's been no doubt that COVID has forced um, willingly uh, for, for many of you, a new approach to teaching and learning. And I guess the challenge across the whole TAFE net network is what's best suited for uh, in-class delivery uh, on real equipment um, and what, how do you supplement it with um, various forms of digital uh, delivery. And of course, from a TDA viewpoint is how can we get some sense of flexibility within training package requirements and the like that can allow for that blended experience to be delivered, probably in improving quality. Um, as a result of that, rather than perhaps being constrained by a set of rules that don't really match the real world now of digital delivery uh, and the like. 
and potentially a heightened interest from students for different ways of approaching their learning experience. Now we've just heard there from Ron about some of the experiences that we heard back. One of the things we're really keen to be able to make sure comes out of this exercise, and you can use the chat function or the Q&A function, is what's been some of your experiences? What have you learnt out of this? And what are some of the lessons we need to take forward when we talk to both state governments and federal governments about how we move forward in um, this virtual uh, and connected world. So we'll talk about that a little bit at uh, the end. I'd now like to introduce our uh, third speaker, uh, and that is uh, Hus Rapani, um, also known, known as, hey, he's the CEO of InfoSpark Proprietary Limited. He's had 30, over 13 years experience uh, on the coalface, at the coalface, teaching mainly electro uh, technology um, and he also has some expertise in um, automobile, um, auto um, uh, electrics um, as well. Um, having been in the classroom, he's now moved out of the classroom, obviously established this company called um, Infinity Spark, which is really trying to bring new technology. Did I give that name wrong? Oh, sorry, Huss. Oh, <laughs> you can tell me off after if I've used that name incorrectly. But um, uh, what, what Huss has been doing through his company is uh, developing learning technologies that enhance the value of uh, teaching and learning. And some of these uh, toolkits and approaches to uh, teaching and learning uh, have been taken up by several TAFEs, including um, Sunny TAFE, uh, Holmes Glen, the Defence Department as well, um, and uh, Go TAFE. And they all report that they have had a real benefit from um, engaging and using some of this uh, tech technology kit. And so on that note, I'd like to introduce Huss, who is the C CEO of in in Infinity Spark. <laughs> and I've probably got that wrong again, but Huss, feel free to correct me. Over to you. Thanks, mate. Uh, my video is un um, blocked from the there we go. That's better. All right, fantastic. Thanks, Craig, for that introduction. So you got it third time, right? Infinity Spark. Uh, so I'll just share my presentation with everyone. Just give me one sec. So there. Now, everyone present here in the in the session, if you can use your chat box and tell me if you can see my screen, just put a yes in the chat box, please. Fantastic, excellent, excellent. Right, so we will try and make it a little bit more uh, interactive with you, you know, using the chat and telling me uh, some information and I'll ask you that, I'll prompt you for it. All right, so we'll get started with this. Um, the problem is what I wanna start with is the problem is not remote teaching anymore. Last year, what last year has taught us is that we can be very resilient and we come, come across with, uh, quite well with the remote teaching. And I think almost every training organization has picked that up now. The problem has now changed. The problem has evolved into how to engage our trades learners. Now, the, that's the biggest problem. As uh, Ron mentioned, type three and type four is what we're talking about here, the, the trades area where um, virtual classes or the remote classes is very hard to adapt very quickly. There is a lot of preparation in place, which you've seen what Shannon's shown. Uh, and he must have put years and years of preparation in making something like that happen. But how do we make it happen with what we have right now? That's the challenge we're facing. And according to um, Albert Einstein, in the middle of every difficulty lies opportunity. And that's the opportunity we're trying to look at in this presentation. So in my opinion, virtual class really is a replication of the classroom experience because you might have heard of a change management perspective where if you want to go from one point to the other, you can't just jump across, but you've got to go through a transition period. We can take this COVID as a transition period for us. So we're trying to replicate our classroom experience where a trades learner would have that hands-on demo real experience and at the same time learn with this teacher in front of him. That, that's my opinion of a virtual class. The difference between a virtual and a remote class is the remote class is more like facilitation. So a facilitator is someone who would tell the students or guide the students towards 
their assessments and then competence where they have to teach themselves. If I take an example for what happened last year is most of the trainers would log in um, in the morning with all the students logging in at the same time. And then the trainer will tell them that they need to do a couple of topics and then do three or four quizzes. And at the end of the day, they can catch up and see how they went. Or if they had any problems, they can contact the teacher and they will be able to work through that. Now that for me is more like facilitation and nothing wrong with that, with the situation we had last year, that was the best we could do, but could we do any more? So if I was to compare that and see which one is better for our trades learners, I think that the face-to-face -face is the best, but in last year's light, if that wasn't possible, then the remote class, the facilitation isn't the answer, it's the virtual class where you can transition them slowly into a classroom experience in a remote environment. And that's what we're trying to talk about in this presentation. So what do we actually need to make a virtual class engaging? Now, I've broken that down into three sections, a hard skills, soft skills, and tools and equipment. In the tools and equipment uh, section, I've got two game changes that made my uh, classes so engaging that it, it, it was just massive, right? So I want to share that with you towards the end. But let's start with the basic ones first, so hard skill. Engaging learners is easier when you know what you're doing. Now, that's just obvious uh, a thing here. And I came across this quote when I was uh, preparing this presentation that most people have the will to win, but few have the will to prepare. And hard skills are all about preparation and hard work that way. Uh, first thing that you need is technical expertise. Now, this is not a problem for TAFEs. I know that for a fact because I've been to many TAFEs for demos and trainings, and I know that their trainers come with decades and decades of knowledge, education, experience. So this is not where we're lacking. We've got that down pat. The thing that we really need is the relevance, right? This is where a lot of times we can come into uh, trouble when it comes to engaging students. When you tell them a story, when you tell them an information that is 30 years old or 50 years old or 100 years old, it's very hard to grasp them. So we have to have the information relevant that is current, something they can use today or tomorrow or in the near future. And that's where trainer currency comes in. We've been a, a strong proponent of trainer currency we talk about it in every um, networking event we go to. Uh, and we say that, that the trainers need to stay current in what they're doing. If they're working full-time as trainers, it's very hard for them to go out and work in the industry at the same time. So they take up on these opportunities of uh, PD like you are doing right now, where you try and upskill yourself with shorter, more like micro-learning blocks and keep yourself relevant. If you give that relevant inf information to the student, you will see that the engagement will shoot up massively. And the third one, which is a skill that we didn't even care about in trades till last year is virtual class management. Now this we, it was distant as in we didn't even care about it, but now it is a core skill that we have to have. Without this virtual class management skills, nothing would happen. And we are getting there now slowly where we're getting better and better at this skill. Now, I would like every one of you to uh, take the chat box and see if you can tell me which one of these three did you think was uh, the most important to you, or even tell me if there is something I've missed you can add to this list. So I'll give you 30 seconds, please, if you can use the chat box. Yep, Tom, yep, Alison, virtual class, absolutely, that is a big one, isn't it? Uh, if you don't have that, then people will struggle, and, and, and a lot of people did struggle at the start. Fantastic. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, know the tech side. Good one, Ian. That's good. Fantastic. All right, so we've got some good engagement here. Let's go on to the next side of things, the softer skills that we would need. Now, if you think about soft skills, a lot of times you would look at it in corporate, uh, but in this side, I would like you to think of it as thinking of your learners as customers. If you do that, you will increase the engagement. Now, this is uh, might be very simple, but it is very important. Uh, more importantly, in trades, because as apprentices, people that teach apprentices, you could probably uh, work with me on this, that apprentices aren't the ones paying most times paying for their fees. It's their employers. So realistically, the employers are our customers. But by extension, since those apprentices work for those employers, they are our customers. Another thing is, which makes this line a little bit blur, is apprentices get paid to be in class. 
which kind of makes the trainers more like uh, supervisors as well. So we tend to forget that our learners are really our customers because as a training organization, we're in the business of training students. So that's our customers. So if we keep that in mind and change that mindset towards it, it will make a big difference. So in that light, I want to take, talk to you about a couple of things here. First one is my experience when I came to Australia. I came to Australia in 2004 when I was 18 um, to study. I was an international student. Um, my visa process got delayed. And uh, by the time I got here, I was already three weeks late. So when I went to my classes, I realized that I had missed first two classes. One of my classes I went to, I asked the trainer, I said, I missed my two classes because of the visa processing delays. Uh, what can you tell me? Can you help me in some way to get up to speed? And his response was, not my problem that you missed the first two classes. Now, as a customer, you wouldn't want to hear that sort of thing from a supplier. But that's what I heard. And that's where I came up with some points here to discuss with you. And the first one is compassion. Your problems are yours, students' problems are students. I know that, and we understand all that. We don't have to feel what they're feeling, but we have to understand what they're feeling. The empathy is the key here. We have to be compassionate. If the students know that you've got their backs for the training and assessment, you will see that the engagement will go up. They will start to understand the process. They'll start to work with you on that, but that thing needs to change through compassion, through your empathy for them. The next one is respect. Now, this is a two-way street. The trainer and the learner both need to respect each other. Uh, if you are giving respect, you can expect that from the student as well. If you have that, the virtual classes, because you're not in front of each other, becomes a lot more better, a lot more fluid and more interactive. And the last one, which is the biggest one of all, I think, is the enthusiasm. You've got to be excited about your topic. One of the people that is in this webinar right now told me about her experience. She's doing engineering. I won't say her name. Uh, and she told me that one of her lecturers uh, that teaches uh, one of the subjects, he's not very excited about what he's teaching. And it was bad enough when they were face to face. It was very boring and it got so much worse when it's all online. So that's what it's about enthusiasm. It's contagious. If you are enthusiastic about a topic, it will go on to the students. They will get excited about learning it as excited you are or even more um, than, than you are to teach it. So enthusiasm is definitely something that can increase your learner engagement. So again, I would like everyone to uh, use the chat box out of these three, which one did you think was the most important one for you? And if there is something else you would like to add, please go for it. All of them, fantastic. Enthusiasm, absolutely. All three, compassion, yes, yes. Yep, enthusiasm, students uh, light up, very good, fantastic. All three, yes, excellent, excellent. All right, you gotta, you gotta bring enthusiasm in the class, fantastic. All right, excellent. Understanding that we can help enrich the two, yep, fantastic, right? So we've got very good answers here, uh, which brings us to the next part, which is the tools and equipment. Like you gotta have the right tools for the job. And I'm gonna share some of my experience as well. As uh, I heard uh, or read, read one of the quotes here from August Rodin, that nothing is a waste of time if you use the experience wisely. And that's what I want to share with you, my first ever experience or uh, the, the attempt of running a virtual class. And now, this happened last year in, in March when the COVID was just starting to affect us here in Australia, uh, but the lockdowns weren't in place at that time. And I had caught a cold. I uh, went to the doctor. The doctor said that it's probably not a good idea to go to uh, work. If you do, you will just create a bit of panic. Uh, so I decided that uh, if it's already on cards to do some remote learning or remote training, why don't I try one? So I did that. I set up my uh, home office and we'll put a whiteboard here. So I've got a whiteboard on this wall and uh, put a camera tripod. And I asked one of the trainers uh, back in the school to set up a webcam so I could see the students. And I ran that class. Now, of course, it was the first try, so there were problems, but I thought I would run a survey and find out what they thought. So this was my um, result that, that we got from the 18 responses that we got from the students. And you can see that the most of them were okay with it, but there were 17% of them that were on borderline. So they couldn't decide whether they really enjoyed it or they didn't. And uh, then I started to make some improvements. So towards the end, I'll show you the new uh, uh, the survey result as well. 
But then I started to make some improvement to see what I could do to improve their experience. And the first tool that I want to talk to you about is the learning platform, the learning management system. If you haven't got a learning management system for your training organization, then that's where you have to start. If you don't have this, it will be very difficult. The one that I've used is Energy Space and the in-house one that we had where I used to train. And without those two, I could not have done whatever I did for my classes in the last year or even before that. So this is where you would want to start if you haven't got this set up yet. The next one is what we're using right now, web conferencing um, uh, software. Uh, you've got Zoom, Microsoft Teams, Cisco WebEx, and I'm sure there are more, but those three are the most popular. Uh, and we are using it right now. So I believe that most of us are quite used to that system over the year. Um, and built into this, we have a chat function as you're using right now, or polls or question answers and sharing capabilities. But the one that is most important is the feedback mechanism. You have to have a way of asking students questions that you would ask in a face-to-face -face environment. So if you were in a classroom, you would repeatedly ask them, what did you think about this topic? And that's why I've got some examples here. The first one on the left I'm going to point out to is I asked them, how did you find my teaching? You see how I don't make it open-ended. I ask them closed questions. I say to them, too fast, too slow, just right. Because I don't want them to waste time thinking about what they would write. Because if I did that, then I won't get the same engagement. They will say, oh, it's too hard. I have to think about it. But if I just gave them limited options, they will jump on that opportunity to tell me how I'm doing so I could improve. And you can see three out of 16 said that I was going too fast. And that answer helped me change my tactics dynamically, right? So that helps us rather than waiting for the whole session to finish. And then someone says, oh, I didn't understand any of that. Rather than that, I was asking them bit by bit, every few uh, uh, hours, I was asking them these questions. Other types of questions you could ask is, how well did you understand the practical demo that we did? Again, a closed ended response. 80% or more, 50 to 80, or less than 50%. Same thing, I can see that almost everyone understood it. There was no one that was below 50%. So I got that good engagement from them for that demo. Uh, you could even ask technical questions like I've got in the middle there, that what rule would you use for motors? And you can see there's a couple of uh, students, if you are electrical background, you would see that they got it wrong. So I asked them in a private chat that way, why did you uh, choose that answer? And they told me that Chair chose it by mistake. So I could see how they were getting along, they were understanding what was going on. So that feedback mechanism is very important. And on that note, I would like to run a poll to find out what sort of background uh, we've got our attendees here. All right, so take a couple of minutes. If you want to choose what trades area, and this is just an example, really, just to see um, what sort of engagement we have here. All right, excellent, excellent. We will look at that towards the end, uh, the results, but I'm going to keep going to my next part, which is the hardware, right? This is obviously the base of everything we're doing. You've got, got to have a computer, laptop, Mac, whatever you try to use, you've got to have that. I use this webcam, uh, which is a Logitech C922 HD, has a built-in mic, uh, doesn't break the bank. I sometimes use tripod, so when I'm doing an actual practical demo, I use a tripod. If I'm using just like we are now, I've got the webcam sitting on my monitor. Um, another thing that I use that made uh, a big difference uh, is uh, the lights. And so on my side here, on my right, on my right side, and this side, I've got a couple of lights, which makes it a lot clearer for people to see me. So I'll give you a quick demonstration of this. If I turn that off, uh, it's not too bad at this stage because you know I've got blinds open a little bit, but it makes a big difference if you've got the lights on and the people can see you clearly, right? So imagine you're gonna look at this person for another two or three hours. You want to see them clearly, you wanna hear them clearly and you wanna see their expressions as close as possible. Another thing I tend to use is speakers. I don't use um, uh, headphones, um, no offense there, Shannon, 
Uh, but the reason behind using that is, again, I'm going through that transition. We're doing the change management where we're taking the students from a face-to-face -face class towards a situation where we are getting toward virtual, but we don't want to lose that link. So this helps me show them that I am in front of them. I am talking. I'm not listening to anything else while I'm at it. So those are the hardware things that I tend to use while I'm doing my classes. Now, this was a, a very big deal for me, a commu communications platform. Most trainers tend to use emails. And the problem with emails is it's just as bad as a snail mail now. Now, the expectation with the email is you will respond to them within a few minutes, which never happens. You might be waiting for a day, you might be waiting for a week, and you might never get a response. That's just what email is now. Now, it, it, when you're trying to engage a student, you're not just trying to engage them in the class, but you're also trying to engage them outside the class. They have to know that they can get in touch with you and there will be some response sooner or later, but in a timely fashion. With emails, the problem is it's more one-to-one. -one. You can do the group email, you know, put everything in there, but still a lot of times people tend to click on reply instead of reply all, and you will miss out on that chain. But with the chat, it makes it a lot easier. Now I'm taking the, uh, the point that I took earlier when I said, you have to think of your learners as customers. And the rule of any business is you got to go where your customers are, not try to bring the customers where you are. And that's what I tried to use here as well. All our customers, our students are on Facebook, or I would say about 99% of them. And I went to that and I said to them, how would you like to have us chatting on Facebook Messenger? And everyone was happy with that. So we created a group and I only ordered, added a couple of them and they added all of their classmates in there. And it became so much easier to communicate and share information. In fact, the group that I created last year in June, now I don't even teach them and they're still using that group to share information about the subject that they're learning. So it's very powerful to use a tool, a platform that they're comfortable with so you don't get that resistance. And once you see that, or once they see that you're working with them in something like that, then you will see that engagement will just go up. They will start to talk to each other. They will start to share information with each other and they will come up with ideas that could make things even better. So that was very important for me, the communications platform. Which brings me to the first game changer that I wanted to talk to you about. I started using iPad whiteboard after I learned a few things that uh, the actual whiteboard didn't work too well in a lot of situations. To make this work, I used the iPad, linked it wirelessly to my computer, and then shared that screen from my computer whenever I would have my virtual class. And that one made so much of a difference with the students. So I'm gonna, I've, I've actually created a, a short 30 second video, which I'm gonna show you in a sec, and have a look at that and, and see what, the, what that comes out as. I've disappeared there. Am I still here? All right, that video there was, um, uh, I mean, it was good from my side because it made things a little bit easier for me. I wanted to find out from the students what they thought about that. So I did a quick survey for that. And this is the result from one of the students' responses. I'll leave this uh, on the screen for a little bit. All right, so just to quickly um, 
uh, explain to you what the student was saying was he enjoyed that everything was ready beforehand, right? So that's the first thing that we have to be prepared. Uh, second thing was he didn't like the whiteboard at all. He said the iPad worked really well. Most importantly, he could read it quite clearly. And the second one was that I was emailing them the notes uh, at the end of every class, which they really enjoyed because they could then use those notes compared to their own notes and then use it through LMS or their textbook and then follow along, which made it so much easier for them to, uh, uh, to do their assessments when they got to, the, to that part. So that was a great experience for them. And that's what we're all about here. And that's why I said this is a game changer. The second game changer we had was uh, the training equipment. Now, I'm a little bit biased towards this one because this is what we manufacture, among other equipment for electrotechnology. But any equipment that you use in your trades area, you have to use it in your virtual classes as well. You can do a demo using a webcam. You can do it uh, as a pre-recorded video if you like. You can do it as a 360 video, as Shannon mentioned. Anything you can do, you've got to have something that is real, right? So all our learners, the reason they come to TAFE is because they want to get that hands-on experience. If we can't give them the hands-on experience, least we could do is show them visually, right? So if it's not kinesthetic, at least visual impact will make a big difference in understanding of the concept. In one of my classes, I was trying to teach the students about star and delta connection, which uh, uh, almost all of your, uh, uh, our electrical people understand what I'm talking about here that what will be the effect on the load if you go from a star connection to delta connection. So I made a short video for that, which we'll share in a minute. Now, in the last video, we couldn't hear the audio. Uh, if we can turn the audio on on this one, please. In this video, I'm going to connect the circuit with these lamps in star and then delta so we can see the difference. Let's get started. Now create a star point with U2, V2 and W2. And let's bring that star point out to this switch. From the switch, we'll go into the meter here so we can measure the neutral current. Okay, let's turn that switch on so whenever we power this up we can measure the neutral current straight away. Okay the meters are ready let's turn it all on and see what we get. These lamps are drawing 1.1 amp each because they're all balanced. All right so that's a balanced circuit we can see how the neutral current is very small it's about 20 milliamps if I turn this off you'll see how there is no noticeable difference in uh, the lamp's brightness. Now to change this to delta, first thing we know is we don't need neutral. So I'm going to remove the neutral. What we also don't need in a delta is a star point. So let's remove the star point. What we do need in delta is connections between the terminals here. So when we started this circuit, I mentioned that this is our phase U, phase V, phase W, U1, V1, W1, which makes this U2, V2, and W2. So let's connect a delta now, which goes from U2 to V1, V2 to W1, and W2 to U1. Turn them on. You can see how the lamp is a lot brighter than before and we can also see the currents are now 2.5 instead of 1.1 as we had earlier. I hope all of this made sense. If you found this video useful please like it and if you know someone who can benefit from this please share it with them and also subscribe to this channel if you want to get regular updates of my videos. Thanks for watching.
And that video was uh, was something that I put on YouTube just so the students could um, engage it when, when engage with it whenever they want to, and that's why there was that last part of liking the video and subscribing to it. Uh, but I took a feedback from them after I showed them after I showed them demos and videos, and this is the response I get. The key here is in this response in, in the question here is you notice I'm asking them how I can improve or anything I can do to improve. And that brings me back to the same point where I said earlier is you've got to treat your students, your learners as your customers. You keep asking feedback. You keep asking how you can serve them better, how you can make their experience better. And they will tell you. And that just that questioning will make the engagement a lot better uh, of, uh, from both sides. Like you will start enjoying to teach them and they, they will start enjoying to learn from you as well. Now, as I was saying earlier, I showed you my first attempt survey, and I will show you my survey after I've made all these improvements. And you can see how the, the people that were in the middle were about 17%, and now we've got about 8%. So we dropped that uh, a problem uh, phase a lot below, and then most people started to enjoy what we were doing, right? So it's that improvements that we did with the game changes and with the communication and with all the preparation that made that big difference. Uh, in conclusion, what I would say is the solution is still in progress. We're still coming out of that problem from last year. It still hasn't gone away. I hope it never comes back, but we are seeing some of that in WA at the moment. Hopefully they're all uh, healthy there. Um, but the need for the virtual classes is not going to go away anytime soon. There is a place for it. We've learned our lesson from last year. And we're not going to repeat that same mistake again. We'll be ready this time. But you're not alone in this. We can work together. And for that, I've created this page where you can book in a half hour free phone consultation where we can talk over some virtual engagement strategies, uh, a training equipment that you could get for electrical. Uh, we could talk about uh, staff training uh, and, and all those sort of things. So this link here, if someone can put this link in the chat box for me, please. Fantastic, right? So you could use this at a later date if you like, but uh, yeah, I'd love to work together with you. Before we go somewhere, we want to uh, talk about the three key takeaways that I'd like you to take from this presentation. First one is the trainer currency. We've got to stay relevant for our students to keep them engaged. We've got to give them the relevant information. Second is to keep thinking of them as our customers and keep thinking that what would you do if you were a customer uh, in a shop or in a business. And the third one is the game changes that I found for trades would be um, uh, a godsend is the practical equipment and the iPad um, uh, whiteboard. Thank you. Thanks, Hassan. As you can see from the comments coming through, um, they've really enjoyed seeing that practical demonstration of what is possible in, uh, uh, in this new world that we are entering. Ron, have we got a, any more questions that are coming through? We're just going to go for a couple more minutes, folks. Let me turn my camera on. <laughs> um, as you may be able to tell, uh, oops, sorry, uh, let me just turn my camera on. As you may be able to tell, uh, folks, I, I, I'm not of a teaching or lecturing background, <laughs> like Shannon and us. So, uh, challenge in that space. Um, I think one of the um, interesting um, things us is the journey that you've take, been on, and I think that that's been um, coming across quite well in terms of um, the appreciation people see for your journey. Um, I just wanted to perhaps, um, probably a little bit of a left field question here, but in terms of looking forward, where do you think some of the online trade um, experiences may go um, from where you've come um, so far? So, I mean, where we were, and, and everyone will probably uh, agree to that, is we were still stuck in the face-to-face -face training. And that is the best, really, for the trades learners. You can't, I mean, they've been trying to do facilitation. They've been trying to do rolling enrollments. They've been trying to do remote training. Um, but it, it was never implemented in a way that would work 
really well and mainly because it's just too hard with trades and just recently because we had to come up with some ideas we are coming up with more ideas if whatever happened last year hadn't happened we would have continued doing whatever we're doing and it was working right so it's like uh, that old adage is if it if it ain't broke don't fix it and that's what was going on but it broke and uh, not by anyone in particular it just broke by nature and and we had to then work towards improvements I think the journey is more about managing that change first rather than jumping into something that is radical and saying that let's stop all the uh, face-to-face and just concentrate on LMS or stop all the teaching and make it all uh, uh, facilitation. Instead of that, I think it would be good to then transition our learners into where we're trying to go. Like virtual reality is, is I think it's a great uh, a game. I mean, it might not be an end game, but it is somewhere we could go and could increase our uh, learner engagement massively. Uh, again, I'm not sure how ready we are, but from what Shannon's shown us, we've actually uh, are quite ready. And, and we're also uh, doing leaps and bounds by reducing the cost and, and increasing the, um, uh, the technology or, or making a better, better use of it. Thanks very much, Hus. And, and I guess, um, uh, Shannon, um, following up from what Huss has just sort of um, observed, one of the um, um, questions that has come through and is probably pertinent in a sense is that in terms of the work that you've been doing and, and what Huss has mentioned, um, is that something that is a whole of TAFE or a whole of um, TAFE SA approach to moving this forward and that you have that um, broad support across the TAFE or is it something that's really been, you've had to drive out of your section alone and and try and convince other people within your TAFE to, to pick this up and run with it. So this was part of um, an ESSA, a Skilling South Australia funded project, which came up out of our work group, but was driven um, basically from our executive level down. Um, our work group was treated as a, as a pilot, um, but the intention has always been, and, and this is where it gained broad support was the fact that it was applicable across a wide number of programs. So, um, and that's, we've always seen, I mean, when you're delivering 1200 units of competency, um, for a project like this to get broad support, it has to be applicable from everything from, like I said, vet nursing has been one of the uh, most recent engaged groups. They, they use it because they found it's a great way for students that have never been in an operating theatre to give them that experience. Um, and like Craig said, you can give some of those quite visceral experiences, which you just can't really get any other way other than physically being there. Um, that's um, a very interesting, very valuable. Thanks, Shannon. I think um, as you look through some of the, the chats there, there are obviously some things, as, as someone's pointed out, making um, learning how to make a good cup of coffee um, sort of a, at the end of the day is something you need to do at a hands on as a hands on experience, but there's a lot of background to that that can be done in, in a virtual sense as well. Um, um, which is vital to pa pass on that knowledge and those skills and, and in terms of demonstrations as well. Um, so I think um, um, we, we, what will happen now, I think, is we, what we'll do is um, circulate this recording to everyone, but there's a lot of um, points and observations made. Some of them just came to the panelists. Um, some have come to panelists and all attendees, and we'll collate those and um, get them out to everyone so people can see what the um, key points people were making. But also, um, where there are questions in the chat, we'll make sure that we um, put some responses out to people as well. Thanks, Ron. Over this last hour and a quarter, we've had um, over 160, close to 170 participants. And as many of you said in your uh, one of the surveys that or the the pulse surveys that uh, Hus gave, um, you are mainly from uh, the trade areas. Uh, so that's great to see that level of engagement. I know that one thing that Shannon has spoken to me about on quite a, a regular uh, basis is imagine the power of all of uh, tape teachers, particularly tra tape trade teachers. Um, working together and sharing off um, each other. And uh, it's been a great demonstration that you've been able to come into this session. So if you've got any ideas about how we could do that, very happy to try to see what we can uh, facilitate. I know, for example, that quite a number of your qualifications are in transition now, uh, particularly electrotech, and I know that's causing some degree of um, anxiety um, across the network. 
And I do want to let you know that um, your CEOs, your quality managers are alert to that. And that we're trying to figure out some way that we could share some of the workload uh, around that without compromising, of course, the particular way that you would want to teach within your TAFE Institute. So that's possibly just one way that we think we can, can work together. The whole thing about what we're trying to do through uh, this webinar, our TAFE talk series, and through our newsletter, for example, is to really demonstrate um, the power of TAFE, the power of TAFE in a place, in a community, and the power of TAFE in responding to industry. And imagine how much more powerful we can make it if uh, we're working in the same direction in a unified way using the latest in technology. So that's really the aim and objective that we have in running some of these webinars. So we really do want to thank you for that. One of the consequences of you registering for this, and thank you very much for your comments, is we've registered you for our TDA newsletter, or we will register you after this event. Um, and that comes out every Monday. That'll give you a sense of some of the news that uh, is going on within the sector. Sometimes there's a bit of a quirky introduction uh, from the CEO of uh, TAFE Directors Australia. Um, I'm mainly making that as a political commentary to um, uh, bureaucrats and the like, but nevertheless, you may enjoy reading that at times. Equally, if there are stories that you want to have, that you want to share around the TAFE community, that's a platform for you to be able to think through. So on that note, I really do want to thank uh, Shannon uh, and Ron and Huss for uh, making this contribution. We really hope you enjoyed it. We'll come out with a survey to ask you for some um, uh, suggestions about what we could do next. It has been absolutely fantastic to see that you've uh, been part of this session. And maybe next time we'll look towards having, giving you a certificate that can go onto your professional development uh, uh, register um, as part of your requirements under the RTO standards that ASQA uh, looks at. Um, that's certainly on our agenda as well. So on that note, uh, enjoy the rest of your day and uh, we'll hope to see you again next time. Thanks very much, goodbye.